Can you get this filed in real quick? So I don't flash it out of the room. Is that better? Better? That's better. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here today. I know you're all here to see Judy, and uh, I'm so glad that we get this great too. I want to thank everybody who has worked on or supported these conservation conversations. We're going to have more of them. If you like what you hear um, and you see today, please tell your friends and your neighbors about these events. As Judy presents the amazing story of the monarch, please realize that the monarchs are pretty much attractive megafauna. They are, they're kind of a, um, a placeholder. They were, I mean, in addition to being amazing creatures on their own, they also represent oh, hundreds, if not thousands, of other species who are also at risk from decline and conservation. So, um, in 2008 and in 2015, the, um, the surveys in Geauga County about our parks show that the, the public truly supports the mission of conservation in our parks in Geauga County. Um, so we want the Park District to once again honor the desires of the citizens and support conservation as the primary purpose of our parks. The past two years, the Grand Del Shumway Board has been falling away from conservation as the primary um, motive of, of a park and using nature only as a backdrop for other activities. Um, so what we're hoping to do is educate more and more people about the need for conservation and talk to people like Judy will help to enable us to do that. Um, what we're going to do today is introduce Judy. At the end of Judy's talk, we have, we'll have cake and some recreation. Anybody, it's a really hot day, so that if anybody needs uh, something to drink, please feel free. We have water and glasses and lemonade, iced tea. You know, for anybody who wants something to drink while you're sitting, please feel free. And at the end of the uh, at the end of the event, um, please, if you don't get a chance to sign in or pick up any literature. Um, or signs, t-shirts, etc. Please feel free to stop in at the end, at the end too. So, because it's a hot day and we want to, we want to have the maximum amount of time with Judy, I'm going to have to come up and introduce Judy. Okay. Okay. Hi, folks. Real quick, the they make this facility available to us at a higher discount in cost. And uh, for folks who uh, depend upon the kindness of strangers and resistance, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, and uh, so thank you, Mr. Jackson. We appreciate it. Uh, as uh, was just pointed out, this board uh, has shown no regard for conservation. I'm going to talk about the monarch butterfly today after they mowed down the field. I'm very familiar with that over uh, in one of the parks that's where uh, monarch butterfly children came together for year after year to do tidy, and that field is no more. It's on a new space park. But, Judy um, Summerlock, uh, supporting the she here, is a scientist, educator, and photographer, and conservation hero. I've been out on any number of field trips with Judy and Larry, and Judy is a very, uh, uh, is one of those people that you love to go out with uh, because she knows everything and you hate going out with her because she knows more about your specialty than you do. <laughs> and then you both take the same picture and the next day Bruce shows up in the plane dealer. Uh, but uh, it's always very interesting if you ever want to know about the bowel habits of the raccoon and you might talk to Judy to explain that to this one. Uh, Judy joined the staff at the Flingo Museum of Natural History as a conservation specialist in 2005. She won't tell you that she came over from the dark side. She was a uh, petroleum engineer in, the, in her early day. Uh, she is the co author of the popular field guide, Dragonflies and Damselflies in Northeastern Ohio. So there was a difference until I was out with her once. Um, and she's received numerous awards from the Portage County Conservation Hero Award for Environmental Stewardship, the Outstanding Staff Achievement Award from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and the Gentian Award from the Native Plant Society. Um, and uh, 
it's as economic as the uh, uh, outstanding or where is it? Something from the second top. Here's here's the uh, the thing that we all are here for the next for the future. She developed a hands-on science curriculum for students from preschool to eighth grade level. And that's what this is about. This is about the future. Judy? Judy send up. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for having me today. Uh, the talk is a little bit long, but we'll get through it quickly so we can go right to the tape. But I'm, I'm going to talk about a lot of different aspects of monarchs, their, the way that they live when they're up here, the way that they live when they're down in Mexico, and everything in between. So if you have any questions, please ask during the program, so in case you, you know, forget them later, or if you have any comments you'd like to make. Like I said, we'll try to get through this. Uh, the idea of having this particular presentation is because monarchs have really come into their own as being very, very important and sort of being an environmental indicator of just how bad things have gotten in certain areas. And not only just in geographic areas, but across the country and even down going into Mexico and some of the things that cause problems down there as well. So I have, I have asked my lovely and talented assistant, Larry Roche, to come today. Uh, Larry and I spend a lot of time out in the field. We both work for the museum. And most of the work that we do is going on properties, whether they're public or private, and telling people what they have, what they don't have, what they should get rid of, what they should keep, how can they enhance it better for things like pollinators, so forth and so on. And we get a lot of programs. We take a lot of kids out, and we get to see how excited they get when they see a caterpillar, they get to hold a dragonfly, things like that. So with that said, kind of basic for those of you that may not know some of the things about monarchs and their natural history, and then we'll go right into the new So, let's see. OK, when we look at monarchs, we tend to think that every orange butterfly we see is a monarch, and all the little orange butterflies we see, like pearl crescents, are baby monarchs. Well, that's not true. Butterflies only grow bigger as they get older. When they come out of their chrysalis, they are the size they are going to be throughout their life, which may not last very long. Okay? Now, in this photo, we're showing a monarch and a vice Go ahead. And those two arrows. <laughs> Okay. So, this is a monarch, this is a viceroy, and these two lines that you see on the hind wings are what the note of difference between a monarch and a viceroy. They, the viceroy has taken on what's called protective mimicry, which means through the, the time that they have evolved, they evolved to look like a monarch because not a lot of them eat monarchs. They don't taste good because of the chemicals from the plants that they eat, which are the milkweeds. But the viceroy caterpillar doesn't eat anything like that. So they taste really good. I just don't want the birds to eat them at this stage. Okay, all right. Okay, there's our monarch caterpillar. The black, the yellow, and the white. There's our viceroy. Now, the viceroy in that picture is fully grown. And it, sometimes people think it looks like what they call the bird poop caterpillar. There's a whole group of them that look very undesirable to a bird because the bird might think that it is bird poop. And that's the way it survives and makes it through to adulthood, hopefully. So it eats, its big food is willow, and that's what it really likes. So it'll sit, sit on willow trees of, and willow species and just eat away and may not be picked up because it looks like bird food, but the butterfly does not often get attacked by a bird or something because it looks like a okay. Now, when you see the slight difference, this is this is the viceroy. Right? There's that wing line again where the wings are closed. But you can see the size. Monarchs are quite a bit bigger than viceroy, but when you're only seeing one or the other and you're not certain, always look for that band. And then, of course, then it shows you how big they are in the can. This one has a little tag on it because of the monarch tagging program, and we'll talk about that too. Now, if you want to tell the difference between males and females, Males have this little black patch right here, right there, and that's on the hind wings. They're more easily seen when the wings are open and not as often seen when the wings are closed. But those little black dots release what are called pheromones, 
for attracting females. So as they send their scent out, so to speak, the females will detect it and come on in, and there's the female with no black spots. Also the veins in between the orange on the wings are thicker on the females than they are on the males. Now when you are looking at them in the field, the gators are female again, but there's a mating pair. And butterflies mate end to end, which means the boy passes, the sperm passes on to the female, and then the female is able to fly out and lay eggs. And of course, it needs to lay eggs on milkweed, plant and milkweed family. And there's the little arrow pointing for that little black spot in the middle. Now, you can also tell them apart when you find a chrysalis and you look at the chrysalis. So this is the top view of the chrysalis. So what you look for is, this is called the cremaster, which is the little structure that attaches it to a leaf. And these are called the sternites. These are these little rings at the top of the chrysalis. Basically, if it is a girl, sorry, the symbol is silent. If it's a girl, there'll be a line right here between these pairs of dots. And if it is a male or a boy, there, there won't be a line there. So when you're out and about and you happen to find a chrysalis or you're collecting caterpillars and drawing them, you know, to catch up to kids, you can teach the kids that they can actually tell the sex before it happens. So that's what you look for, that little line there. Okay? Now, what do you look for in the eggs? If you're looking for eggs, Typically, you want to look on the bottom of the leaf, and that may be a common milkweed or orange butterfly weed, but there it is there. It's pretty tiny. There's the midrib of the leaf. And a lot of times, or in some research I've read, where typically the ones that are laying eggs early, early in the season, they will lay them on common milkweed, but as they lay later in the season, they find, we find that swamp milkweed or some of the other species of milkweed are chosen more commonly and more, uh, more often. So that's our little egg there. The, man, the female will stand usually on top of the leaf, on the side of the leaf, and she curls her abdomen underneath the leaf, she plants the egg, and then goes on and lays another one. She does not lay a bunch of them in a big mass like some other butterfly and moth species do. So there's a nickel. There's the egg. It gives you some scale. Okay. This is one that's really, you know, zoomed in so you can see the texture. A lot of butterfly eggs and moth eggs have, have things on the side that give stability to the egg. So they'll either have these lines, sometimes they'll have a star pattern, but all of those patterns aid in making that egg strong. If it was just a clear outside that doesn't have much granulation to it or any kind of lines to it, it makes the egg weak. And then there, when the egg gets ready, it starts to turn dark. So if you find an egg and you see that it's dark, it's usually closer to the time that the caterpillar will hatch. Okay. Now, when they hatch out, they basically come out of the egg at first, because they basically chew, chew a little hole to come out. Okay. Their first meal is the egg. And the reason for eating the egg is because other predatory insects or birds, if they find an egg that is hatched, they look around for what came out of that egg so they can eat it. So, smart as they are, they will eat their egg first, and usually the only thing remaining is like a little, um, like a shiny spot on the leaf or like a little pad. It doesn't look like much, but there's a lot of nutrition in that egg, so that is their first meal. Okay. And then as they grow, the they don't grow like we grow. Uh, we grow and we get bigger and we get, we sometimes have to change our clothes because we get bigger. But insects grow, they can't continually do that. Once they get to the size that that skin supports, they have to split that skin, crawl out of it, they'll be in a new skin, and they continue to feed into that new skin until they fill that skin and they continue to do that. Those are called instars. And caterpillars, but modern caterpillars go through five instars. And it takes about two weeks from the first instar, which is this little guy here, to the end. Go ahead which is this guy at the end. And you'll see that they've got little, what look like antenna on the front and on the back. So a lot of people will look at it and say, well, how can I tell the front from the back if they have antenna on both sides? Well, they're not really antenna. They're just, they're 
part of the way that they look. The ones on the front are going to be longer, and they're going to sort of arch back over, and the ones on the back are going to be straighter. They're not really for sensing anything. They do all their sensing with their feet. Go ahead. And then this shows you. Here's the first one, second, third, fourth, and fifth. So that shows you how they go through that progression. And, you know, the lines get darker and wider as they get older. Okay? Now, if you're out looking for pupa or chrysalis, it can be very, very difficult to find. Sometimes it can be very easy. Uh, a lot of times what they'll do is they won't, after they've fed and they're ready to make their chrysalis, they don't immediately lay it or make it on the milkweed. They will a lot of times make it on something that might have more stability to it, like, a, like say, a tree branch or something that's down low, a shrub, something like that. But in this photo, this is taken in my garden, which I plant specifically for pollinating insects. So there's all kinds of things in there. People think it looks like a big giant mess, but I have more butterflies and more caterpillars than, than I can count. Go ahead, admit it. Now go back again. No, go back. Okay. So now that you see where it is, now it's on a turtle. This is on a turtle head in the air. It's on the underside. Can I hit it again? Okay. So it can be very, very hard to find. But sometimes you find them and they're that beautiful kiwi or lime green color and they can be easy to find if there's nothing else around it. So you can look for them. What you don't want to do if you find one is rip it off the leaf and take it home and put it in the box. Okay, that's not going to help them at all. They need to be upright because of how they hatch out. They need to be right where they were put. It, it's better if you are collecting, for example, for a school project or something like that, it's better to try to find a caterpillar and set up a tank so that it can actually make its chrysalis in the tank rather than trying to take the chrysalis out of the water. Okay? Now, Getting ready to make its chrysalis. It's in its fifth instar. It goes into the J, what they call the J pattern. Now what they do is they take silk from their body and they make a pad on the leaf or wherever they're going to place it. If you can see that leaf is kind of have a whitish cast to it, that's all silk from their body. So they reinforce this attachment point so that if there's a hard wind or if there's hail or if it has a you know bad rainstorm, it just doesn't fall out of the leaf because at that point it will not make it. Doesn't have the energy left to go make another little attachment point, which is called that pronaster. So, for about 12 to 15 hours, it is in that J position. Mm -hmm. And then, what it does is it has a J and it elongates, and then it, the skin grows from the top of the, where the face was down to the pronaster where they're attached. And that's basically the stages that it goes to until it makes that final crystal. Sometimes you'll see it, you'll see this little black thing, and you think, well, they're going to die because it's black. That's the leftover skin that they just catch out. Sometimes it falls to the ground, or sometimes it stays attached. And while it's in this pupil stage right here, before it hardens off, you can watch it, it actually wiggles because it's in there doing its all its little monarch things that it does in order to make the adult. Okay? And then when it's done, It'll look like that. So after several more hours, it hard, the skin will harden, and it'll be at that stage for about nine to twelve days. And that duration could be weather related. If we have a bunch of really cold weather for a longer period of time, they they're physically able to stay in there longer. Uh, they you know basically don't want to come out and drive a rainstorm because if they can't open their wings and expand them and take the fluid from their abdomen and put it into their wings, and their wings are fully stretched out. All the fluid from their body basically goes into the veins in their wings, and that's what makes the wings strong enough to use for flight. Okay? And when it gets ready to hatch, you can look through the chrysalis, it'll actually be clear, and you can actually see there's a wing. When you look at the chrysalis, you can look, if you look at it closely, you can see exactly where the wings are, you can see where the antenna are, and you can see where the head would be, you can see it right on there. And then as it comes out, this is why it's important that it hangs vertically, because it uses gravity in order to work itself out of the chrysalis, and as its wings start to expand, it takes its feet, and it crawls back up that chrysalis, and it notches, it's got little notches on its feet, that it uses the top of the chrysalis like a little ladder, and it'll hang there. Yes, sir? Are they subject to uh, predators? They are. Uh, when they come out and they're like this and they're wiggling and making motion, 
Birds will try, but praying mantises can basically eat them at any point. And when they're a caterpillar, things like uh, the true bugs, like uh, stink bugs, any of those in that group, they can all eat them as well. Leaf wooded bugs, they're all predatory like that. But in particularly in this stage, before they're totally out and ready to fly, probably the biggest predator is praying mantis. Now, we're going to talk about what they need, we're going to talk about what they don't need, and we're going to talk about, unfortunately, what we give them, which isn't always what they need. Uh, so what they do need is they need nectar plants. And this is, this is the difference between nectaring plants, which is what the adults feed on, and food plants, which are what the caterpillars feed on. So as you can see, there's various acids, milkweed, some of many of our perennial plants that are now out because this is the time. So you'll start to see them, depending on the season and the weather, you start to see them come in in July. And basically, they're here until they get ready to go back. And their offspring are the ones that get ready to go back. So all different types of plants, and we'll talk about those plants, that are the next plants for the adults. So there's things like milkweeds, swamp milkweed, orange butterfly weed, common milkweed. The mints. Lots of plants in the mint family are very good for butterflies in particular, moths, um, other nectarine insects. But the bergamots, which is the monardas, uh, in that same group, and any of the mountain mints. There's several species of native mountain mints that are exceptionally good for these species. Not only do they have a lot of nectar, but they have the right tubular flower that the, the butterflies have that nice long tongue that they can stick down in that flower and get the nectar. Old rods, and I can't stress old rods enough, especially at this time of year, because remember, when these caterpillars that we have right now hatch into adults, those are the ones that are going to start their journey back. And if they don't have food to eat along the way, they're not going to make it to Mexico. So gold rods and asters and tall iron weed, things like that that bloom later in the summer and bloom into the fall, are vitally, vitally important. And we'll talk more about that. Gold rods are very important. And golden rods do not make you sneeze because they're pollinated by insects. The plant that makes you sneeze, which is ragweed, happens to bloom or come up at the same time as golden rods, but they're pollinated by the wind. And that's why people sneeze from it, because their pollen is blowing through the wind, whereas golden rods doesn't happen that way. They can only be pollinated by insects. Okay? Asters, which are now just starting to kick in and open up and you know become very viable food sources. Okay? Joe Pye, Bones Nut, Leactris, and again, a lot of these, these are all native plants. These are all things that you guys can, can plant or suggest being planted in areas that need to have more native than not native. Okay. And the tall iron leaf, like a Susan, Blue Vervain, all of these are very, very good nectarine plants for adult vines. And also, we think more about the perennial plants, but also think about trees and shrubs as well, because they can pack a lot of nectar, and they can, especially if you're interested in taking photographs, if you have a lot of plants in your yard that attract butterflies and moths and insects for nectar, they're going to stay on that plant and nectar, and it's a really good time to take your picture, other than trying to chase them and kneel down and stand up and chase them and kneel down and stand up. You've got a much better shot if you plant. So spirea, Rathlinia, water willow, summer sweet, lots of different options. Now, what, what else do they need? Well, they need food plants for the caterpillars. And as most all of you know, that their food plant is something within the milkweed family. They can't eat anything else. There's a couple of plants that are in a group of plants where they will lay their eggs on them, but when that caterpillar hatches, they can't eat them. It's just like the West Virginia white and the garlic or with the plant called black swallow. Keep in mind that butterflies and moths tell where they lay their eggs by their feet. So when they land on a plant, the little sensors in their feet tell them at the plant that their egg can survive and the caterpillar can survive. So when monarch lands on something in the milkweed family, they know, ha, I can land here, I can place an egg here, and it's got a shot. Okay? So, oh, as you can see, they'll eat all parts of the plant. This one's eating a seed pod. This one's eating a leaf. This one's eating part of the, the, the stem part of the individual floweret. So, and on this one, this is a real bonanza on this one. You got the caterpillar, you got the adult, you got a grasshopper, and you got lots of monarch. 
People will say to me, well, how do you find these all the time? Well, if you're looking for caterpillars, look for poop. And you can see that. Look for poop. These little brown things, there's a caterpillar and it's feeding on the underside of the leaf. After it eats, you know it has to come out the other end. So if you see those little brown things, look under the leaf. Because one may be hiding there. And that's a good way to look for it. Okay. Now, this next segment is going to talk about the different milkweeds that are native to Ohio. We have about 13 or 14 species. And these are all ones, some of them need very specific habitats. They're prairies, or they need dry soil, or they need, and you can look these all up and find more information about them. But a lot of people are getting on the bandwagon with this, and they're planting more than just the typical kinds, and they're trying to put them in the right type of habitat, and they're having great success. So, we have our common milkweed, and I'll have a list at the end of give the common name and the Latin name. And but right now, I just want to show you some of the pictures so that you can see. World milkweeds have very, very skinny leaves. Four leaf weed is exactly that. Four leaves are kind of in a whirl. A lot of these, um, several of these species we find more in central and southern Ohio, like in the Adams County area down there. But many of them can be grown up here and do pretty well if you're able to, you know, sort of emulate the soil and, and water conditions they need. Pope milkweed is more of a more loosely bloomed the way that the flowers hang on the umbels. Purple milkweed is really gorgeous and it's really purple. It's sort of a fuchsia purple color. Uh, this is one I'd like to try in my yard and I'm working on trying to do that. Orange butterfly weed, which we know is pretty common for us, and swamp milkweed. Now what we find, there's going to be another screen with some more, but Let's just give a few things about this. Orange butterfly weed is one of those things, very difficult to transplant milkweed because once they start setting their seed and growing, they send a really long taproot down. And when you go and try to pick it up, you break it off and it's not going to work. But you can take things like common milkweed, which run, grow by runners, so there'll be a plant here and over here, there'll be another plant that comes up from there. And, and some people say, well, I don't like it like that. It's going to take over my yard if I, if I keep it. What you can do, uh, and back in the day when they used to get along the roadside, you could get permission to say from the landowner. And what you can do with a common milkweed is you can go dig up the root. And you dig up about a six or eight inch section. And as long as there's eyes on that root, and the root may be about this long, but maybe about as big around this pointer, you take that root, you plant in the ground, about six inches down or so. As long as it has eyes, you keep watering it within, I would say anywhere from two to four years, it'll start planting. And then it'll spread on its own. But if you know of an area, for example, that they typically spray, and they're going to kill the milkweed anyway, it doesn't hurt to try to get permission to dig them up. But if you try to dig up the plant, carry the plant, plant it in your yard, it will die. Now, if you get enough of the root, the top growth may die, and the root may continue, and in a couple of years, it is this one. Uh, orange butterfly weed is one that people see different places, and they go get their shovel, and they dig it up, and immediately they dig it home, and it dies because they haven't gotten the whole root. This one tends to have a longer taproot than the other species. And swamp milkweed seems to be a favorite of the monarchs at this time or later, sort of in the egg laying season. Um, common milkweed leaves get very thick and leathery, and when you're a little caterpillar and just have tiny little jaws, it's a little hard to chew through that. But the new growth and things on swamp milkweed make it a lot easier. So you may have better luck finding caterpillars in swamp milkweed than you do in common milkweed. Some of the other milkweed, Sullivan milkweed, green flower milkweed, and honey vine. Now, Sullivan milkweed is a milkweed of prairies, but you certainly can get it to grow up here. And the green flower milkweed is literally that. If you see something that has a milkweed looking flower and it's green, there are two basic types of green milkweeds, but this is the one that Again, it's more in the southern part of Ohio, very possibly could be down here under the right region. Now this honey vine, all of the ones that I previously mentioned are all in the Asclepius genus or in that family. But there's also what's called honey vine, and honey vine is in the milkweed larger group, but it's a different genus. And this is one, for example, if you go into like mid 